We will not be kind of officially conducting the items on the agenda. Um, I guess I can ask if there's any public comment. Uh, um, Andy's here, as usual, and Susan, thanks for joining us. Sure. And I don't know, you guys probably all know Mary Kate from the London <coughs> board. <coughs> Excellent. Yeah, so no public comment? Okay. Great. So what I'd love to do is turn it over to you, Steve, to go over the work that we've been doing on the articles. And I'll say this again for the 25th time this evening, that if you didn't get a copy, this hard copy of the articles is newer than the one that was emailed. I apologize. I know there have been a lot of drafts that have come out. This was We got some comments from Donna Russo-Savage on the draft that Steve sent that we distributed from yesterday. So she sent comments and Steve revised it again today. So we are like dynamic right now. Do you have, do you have another copy of that? Or no? Are you done? No, that's fine. I, I, I hey. can share it. It's fine. I'll do it. Are you sure? I can definitely make a few more. I, guess. I asked for 15, and we, <laughs> we don't have a quorum. <laughs> we don't have a quorum, but we have a whole mess of people here. Okay. Well, thank you for your flexibility with that. So, Steve? Okay. Um, I've uh, you know, been working with Jen. We've had a lot of emails back and forth. Uh, this is always an iterative process, so that go through various revisions. Uh, another party that's an important participant in the process is Donna Russo Savage, who is the attorney responsible for reviewing Act 46 proposals for the Secretary of Education. Uh, she also coordinates with the Secretary of State's office so that whatever document comes out of the process uh, that you approve is something that has already been thoroughly vetted by the two most important state agencies uh, before it goes to the Board of Education, and that being the Secretary of Education and the Secretary of State's office. And <clears throat> within the last two weeks, uh, there have been a lot of versions going around and uh, I try to keep things up to date so that when I get an email that is proposing, you know, some modifications or uh, addressing some uh, typos or something, uh, try to go ahead and make those. Uh, one of the things that I've discovered in this process, having been through it, uh, is that uh, trying to do everything with red line almost becomes impossible because of the frequency of changes that are occurring so that uh, I try as quickly as possible to get to something that is as close to a final document in pretty clear text uh, understanding that it means for many of you you reviewed earlier versions and you'd like to see exactly what changes have been made since those earlier versions, uh, but in terms of having a workable document, it really turns out to be um, easier to work with it if not everything is redlined. Another thing that I have discovered, particularly with redline versions of Word documents, when we have a number of different entities being involved, there are different versions of Word in common usage through different agencies and public entities, and not everything formats well, meaning that there can, uh, in my opinion or recommendation, only be really one working document. And once I get involved, I try to make it my working document. And so other people may send something back to me and say, okay, I've updated your last version. I don't touch that document, okay? I print it out hard copy, and then I make the changes in the working document that I try to control through the process. So um, that explains, you know, part of, you know, what you're looking at is not per se a red line version. That said, I don't think there are any uh, real 
substantive changes except what I'll point out tonight in, in what you're looking at. One of the things that I <coughs> did uh, to carry through the entire document, and if you look at the, the version that you have uh, that, that came out tonight, Article 1, you'll see that there are some different terms underlined in this Article 1. One of those is elementary forming districts. You can see another underlined high school forming district. Then you can see that there is a new term, new supervisory district, and that uh, uh, we're looking at the elementary forming districts and the high school forming districts together create the forming districts. They're all school districts. You're also working with the Addison Northeast Supervisory Union in this, and it is also a participant. And so uh, there's an, one final term, forming entities. So you really have three different types of entities that are all coming together, your elementary districts, your high school districts, and your supervisory union. And at the end of the process, what you're looking to have through this because is that you will have a supervisory district and you will no longer have a supervisory union. So there will be one governing board for all of the entities that come together. And I went over this with uh, Donna, and, <coughs> uh, and if you eliminate the supervisory union, you become what in Vermont is called a supervisory district. There are only a couple of them in existence right now. But for instance, the South Burlington, they call it the South Burlington School District, it's really a supervisory district. There is a five-member school board in South Burlington. There is no separate supervisory union board. City of Burlington's the same. Okay. There, there are some others, Colchester. But anyway, so I wanted to try to lay this terminology out right up front and then track it right through the document. So there are a lot of places where there's some minor wording changes. The reason for calling them out separately is that there are certain rules in your agreement that apply to the elementary districts. There are some different rules that apply to your high school district, and then finally some rules that apply to the supervisory union alone. So I wanted to make it clear right up front, okay, these are the, the entities that are participating in all of this. The goal is to end up with a supervisory district. And then how do we address that as we go through the various provisions of the agreement? Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. okay. So why did you decide to do the supervisory district rather than a unified union school district? You had in your agreement uh, and I believe it is Article 12, and I didn't change that, but in your Article 12, you have uh, that in the last sentence, the Addison Northeast Supervisory Union shall cease to exist on January 31, 2019. So that tells me that what you wanted to do was be a supervisory district, not a unified union district. Uh, because you don't have to eliminate the supervisory union board. But apparently a decision was made at some point to say, we don't need the supervisory union anymore. Now, and if you think th about it, there's a lot of sense to that, and I'll tell you why. Because if you go to a single unified union district, and you're proposing right now 
that that's going to be governed by a 15 member board. And we'll talk about that. There's <coughs> nobody else involved. Okay? So that 15 member board would then appoint five people, or three people rather, to be your supervisory union board. And the supervisory union would then have with those three people, because each district in a supervisory union gets three votes on the board, unless you're not operating a school. Okay? So if you do not eliminate the supervisory union, you'll have a 15-member board that governs the school district, but a three-member board that does all of the work of the supervisory union. And the 15-member board wouldn't be participating in that. This is, this is all new. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so I would say that, so we had some diagrams, I could dig them out of my binder, mm -hmm. but we had some diagrams that were presented by our consultant that showed sort of that once you go to a unified union, that you don't have a supervisory union anymore. I mean, there would be no point because you're just right. one school district. So I, what I'm hearing you say is that under the law, we should actually call it a supervisory district instead of calling it a unified union district, right? right? But that it's still accomplishing what we expected, that we there would not be a supervisory union and that we would have just the one 15-member board. Right. Let me give you a neighboring example not too far from you, Rutland Northeast. Okay. It just went through a consolidation and it did what was called a side-by-side. -side. It created two unified union districts, one with the Barstow School and one with Otter Valley and the elementary schools feeding into Otter Valley. So. With two districts, it could not become a supervisory district. It has to retain a supervisory union. And each of these two unified union districts will contribute three people, and the Rutland Northeast Supervisory Union Board would continue. It will have six people on that board that are representatives from the <coughs> Unified Union District Boards. In your case, since you will have no other districts other than the Unified Union District, there is no political or governance reason to have a separate supervisory union. You could do that if you wanted to. No. We don't want I, I no, think no. our intention and was to have a like the, the preferred structure under the accelerated mm -hmm. that we've seen, you know, approved in many of the districts around us. So yep. and if, if the supervisory district is the right word for that. I'm just by using that term and maybe that's what's confusing. I I was not changing what I understood you wanted your end result to be, which was one governing board. Okay. I was simply then saying that if it is just one governing board, the, the legal name of that entity under the Vermont statutes mm -hmm. is a supervisory district, yes. not a unified union district. Great. Right. And? Why does the supervisory union continue in existence for seven months after? It doesn't have to, uh, but... Uh, and I would look at that as sort of belt and suspenders. There, once everything comes into play, let's say as of July 1, 2018, which you've set up as your operational date, okay, uh, there is going to be time necessary to close out all the existing books. Okay, so for instance, right. we, we've heard that the audit won't be done. For <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and the union has to remain in existence until it can, in fact, close business. Exactly, and that's the only reason. And it needs a board to do that. Yes, 
Or he doesn't have to meet very often. Doesn't no. <laughs> but it needs a board to do that. It needs a board to do that. Yeah, As in such was looking at once every couple the voters, months. I'll tell you. But but if if, <coughs> if you mentioned the audit and a lot of people don't fully understand school districts since the 1980s have been sort of pushed into operating on an accrual accounting accounting system as opposed to a cash accounting system. Now most of us at home operate on a cash accounting system which uh, as of December 31st of each year you can say this is what I have in my checking account and even though I may have credit card debt that I accrued during the year, I'm going to pay the bill in January and so you're paying it out of next year. But what you have on December 31st in terms of debts or cash, if you wanted to simply close the books, you say that's where it is. But school districts operate on an accrual system, so to, for example with that credit card bill, if all of that was accrued in uh, 2016, let's say, when you pay that off, even in 2017, it gets charged against 2016. Okay, and so that's why you you uh, you know theoretically close your books on June 30th of each year, but it's not until you get the audit some months later that you really know. How much money did we lose, or how much money did we save during the year? Because it uh, waits, and there's a two-month period that accountants generally allow for the receipt of additional income or the paying of additional bills. And then at some point they say it hasn't come in at this point, and so now it just does get put to the next year. Okay, so that that's why the supervisory union would be hanging around, as it as it were to give them adequate time to make sure that they've got the audits in, that everything is balanced and they can close all the books and move on. So it would be fair to say the boards, so the current boards that exist and are the boards that will be building the FY18 budget in the fall need to exist to see that budget that they've developed and that they sort of own through to its completion. Correct. Which is June 30, 2018, which is why July 1, 2018, they can no longer, they can cease to exist, and it would be just a single board. Well, even those boards will remain in existence beyond June 1st, or July 1st, 2018, because again, each district will need to have its own audit and get that completely closed out. And so that's why I believe you have in here that they may remain in existence until December 31st. Excuse me? December 31st. Okay. December 31st. Two yeah. more months. Yeah. And, then the and the supervisory union is pushed off a little later just because okay. first the supervisory union wants to get all of the districts closed out. Then when all the districts are closed out, it can close out its book. And these bodies, the lame duck boards, and, uh, can't spend any more money. All they can do is hang around long enough to account for the money already spent. They could pay some bills if there are some that need to be paid out of, in, in this case, FY18 funds. Yeah. You know, be, and and they will presumably have cash in their banking accounts as of July 1, 2018, if, and that will not automatically transfer to the new entity until they've gotten their audit, and the audit says you, you needed to pay this bill, this bill, this bill to properly charge it against FY18, and then what they have left in their banking accounts is what actually gets passed on as a surplus. And then those boards have the privilege, so to speak, of convening that one last meeting to basically say, is there any more business for us to do? And they say, no, everything has been accomplished. And then um, I have a motion to uh, disband such and such school district. Boom.
goes out of existence. Great, Sarah? I'm, I guess I'm still just a little bit confused because like when I'm reading Addison Central, which I think right now we're doing more similarly to than Rutland Northeast, um, that they do refer to it as Unified Union School District in Article 1. So I, I, I don't... I don't know what Addison Central is doing. They took one, they took the same way that we form, were trying to form ours with seven, and then they did one, 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 based on population, mm -hmm. and then they formed one board. So I personally thought we were trying to avoid having a supervisory district, but I don't, I don't know. Are they eliminating their supervisory union? Yeah, they did. And that's what you can see there. It's referred to as ACSD right. instead of ACSU. But it's school district, not supervisory district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know that to be the case. Allison? And so that's my same concern. All of the other um, unification efforts that have passed, they're calling themselves unified union school districts. So based on what you're telling us, if they're going to call themselves that, they still need an upper three-member board overseeing the board that they have, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem like what the majority of those people were intending to do. I thought yeah. every so. What you're saying to me sounds like they didn't do the right thing. Well, I I can't speak for entities I haven't represented, right. but I did I did talk to. Uh, Donna Russo right. about this because she said you're putting in here that this will be a supervisory district and that will only occur if the state board agrees to eliminate the supervisory union okay and I said that's correct the state board has to agree to eliminate the supervisory union but the document that I was provided to review you know, I, I didn't add this sentence in mm -hmm. Article 12. We, we were just taking from what everybody else was okay. doing. Well, the way theirs read and yeah. the way it was I, presented I, to I, us. I want to say that so. there are a lot of consultants who are working with entities around the state, different consultants. And there are some different attorneys working on things around the state. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying that everything has been addressed the way that I'm recommending that it be addressed uh, in your case, but I can tell you that I have, I have raised this issue with Donna, and I said, there are two ways we can do this. And because she said, it's a separate, state board approval to eliminate a supervisor, supervisory union. I said, okay, let me know. Do you want to take that out of this? In other words, not have it part of this. That you simply form a unified union district, you take the last sentence out of Article 11, or Article uh, 12. And then after this entity is formed, it can make application to the state to eliminate the supervisory union and then turn this into a supervisory district. And I said, the other way to do it, which is what I read in here, is that you want to do it in one step. That you want to move in a direction that says we're going to a single board and no supervisory union. And if what that means is that when the state board approves your plan, <coughs> there will actually be included in the approval motion specific acknowledgement that you are consolidating in accordance with this, and you are requesting authorization to operate as a supervisory district and eliminate a supervisory union. 
which is what I understand from this document is what you want to do. So can I ask, is there is there additional time or risk in doing it all at the same time? No. There, there is, uh, let's say, uh, additional time involved in doing it in separate steps. So I would add per perhaps additional risk in that it, there's the assumption that the second step happens. There's the potential the second step would. Okay. And what function does a supervisor have? I, I should be uh, recognized. What what process do you want me to use? <laughs> Thanks for asking, Herb. Um, um, let me come to you next, okay? Because Ed was just, I don't know if you could hear Ed, he was just asking a question. So I'll come to you uh, next. I can hear, you. I can hear uh, Steve, um, but I can't hear too many other people, but just, just uh, tell me and I'll start. Okay, thank you, Herb. Ed, go ahead. What function does the Supervisory Union Board serve? If you have multiple districts, which is what you have right now. Under state law, the supervisory union hires the superintendent, not the districts. Okay? The supervisory union provides financial and accounting services and a business manager for all the school districts. So the supervisory union hires that business office, okay? And, and when I say supervisory union, I'm talking about the supervisory union board, okay? So hires a superintendent, hires a business manager. A supervisory union is obligated to provide transportation services to those districts wanting transportation services. Supervisory union provides special education services to all the districts. So here you have a director of special services hired by that supervisory union board. And all of your special educators are now employed by the supervisory union. All of your special education paraprofessionals are provided by the, um, the supervisory union. Your supervisory union board organizes uh, collective bargaining negotiations for teachers in Paris. There's some other things, but but the theory is, okay, we've got multiple districts here, three, four, five, six, seven, right. whatever. Right. We're centralizing certain services and the supervisory union board will take charge of those. If you only have one district, that one district, if it's a, quote, supervisory district, automatically assumes all the responsibilities that would otherwise be performed by the supervisory union. Meaning, the supervisory district, which would be your 15-member board, hires your superintendent. The supervisory district board hires the business manager, hires your director of special education deals with your transportation services issues, et cetera, et cetera. So in a supervisory district, you take all the responsibilities of a school district board, combine them with all the responsibilities of a supervisory union board, and that's what become the responsibilities of the supervisory district board. So Great. the decision to if the state board doesn't approve abolishing the supervisory union, what, per, what role would it play in the future? Exactly what it plays right now. Really? Yes. It sort of guts the... <laughs> it, 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 guts your, it, it has a significant impact on your 15-member okay. board because Essentially, you are going to have your three-member supervisory union board hiring your superintendent, not your 15-member <laughs> board. So you want to avoid that. Yeah. Okay, so, well, and that's, and that's what I understood here, and that's why I, mm -hmm. I said what you really want to be is a supervisory district. 
Great. So, guys, so we have, uh, we have, I know Herm and Mary Kate both had wanted to ask a question. I just want to keep in mind that this, this is a very important conversation, and we've been on this topic for about half an hour. We do have some other things we wanted to cover with Steve in the next half an hour. So, let's spend a little more time on this, but then um, continue on. And if there, we can't make any official um, decisions at this moment, although it sounds like we may have a quorum shortly, at which point we might be able to make official decisions. Um, but I would like to be sure that we get to review the suggestions and the changes that Steve's made. So, Herb, thank you for waiting. Uh, yeah, uh, first, uh, welcome, Steve. Uh, glad you're uh, helping us out here. Um, and um, so just for the my channel comment is, uh, is that I think Steve's right. Uh, I'm looking at the definitional section in uh, the education statutes. I mean, I'm not that familiar with uh, educational statutes as well as Steve is, but I'm, I'm looking at the definitions in section 11A24. Supervisory district means a supervisory union that consists of only one school district, kind of which, which may be a, super, a unified union district. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong, Steve, but I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, my question, though, is, what 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 statutory sections are we going under when we're forming this supervisory union, which may be a unified union district? Is that the uh, provision that not kind of forms a unified union school district? I've got that under 742 C. Okay. The. So, so basically, I'm asking is there some other statute that governs how uh, supervisory district is formed other than, um, you know, 722 dealing with unified union districts? I'm sorry, I, I, I apologize for interrupting. Michaela has joined us by conference call as well, so we do now officially have a quorum at our meeting. So I would like to call our meeting to order officially at 7.15, and I just wanted to make sure, since we now have a quorum, that we were on the record. Steve, back to you. Okay. Thank you. Herb, the, this really is a two-step process, and you're combining those steps. The, you're bringing all of your districts together under the statute that deals with forming union districts, or in your case, a unified union district, and you're re referring to 16 BSA section 722. Right. Okay, but then if you go to a separate statute, and I didn't bring my statutes with me, uh, the one that deals with supervisory unions, it has the process by which the state board can designate a unified union district as a supervisory district. So that's why I'm saying there, re there are really two things going on here. One, you're forming a unified union district and you're going through the, the complete process to do that. Because your formation plan also contains this sentence that says the supervisory union is going to go away, will need a separate authorization from the state board under the process for designating a unified union district as a supervisory district. And both of those would be accomplished with the state board approving this document. Great, thank yeah. you. Uh, so uh, that makes sense to me, uh, Steve, and, uh, and the committee that, you know, what you're saying certainly makes sense to me. Great, thank Over you. Now. Thanks, her <laughs> Mary Kate. I just wanted to um, just confirm with you, Steve. There's no risk that the state board in approving the dissolution of the S supervisory union that that could happen before the vote to merge. In other words, if not everybody voted to merge, would the supervisory union be not in existence? So, just a timing question. I'm I'm looking at having the same motion that would approve this plan will within it contain representation and we agree 
that if this unified union district is formed, so it's contingent on that there will be okay. designation of it as a supervisory district okay. upon the elimination of the supervisory union. Thanks. Yep. Great. Thank you. So, shall we go ahead and move on to? I think we're up to Article Six. Was the next one where we had some questions for you, or we had talked about that a bit? Yep. Uh, and. Actually, I, on the the Article Six, and where did I? I know I told you I had buried something else in here. Oh, what the what you added at the bottom of Article Seven, Seven. Oh, it's under Seven D. Yep. No. Okay. Okay. So, um, Article Six is uh, addresses and is consistent with the statutory requirements that all debt operating fund surpluses and deficits and any specially existing funds need to go to the new entity and this accomplishes that okay uh, I uh, recommended that you get a uh, the debt is, is pretty easy to pull together. The operating fund surpluses and deficits, you won't know until audits are completed. But then specified funds, and I've recommended that you get a list of all the funds that are being maintained by each district so you can look at those and, you know, uh, in some cases, it may be a fund that your school districts will want to liquidate locally in FY18 before the merger occurs, because there would not be a prohibition on doing that. And then there may be some that will not be liquidated, but you, those would be transferred to the new entity with, quote, an earmark. In other words, to be used by this entity, or this school building, really, in the future. And you can earmark those funds. Okay? But uh, what I would like to see is an inventory of what those funds are, and uh, then probably make some recommendations about what funds your local school boards may want to eliminate during FY18 rather than look at transferring them okay I also put in here and this is something your the, the language here is pretty much your language I added a, uh, a, a further paragraph transfer of debt and funds uh, that uh, there's an inconsistency in the existing statute with what is contemporary practice in school districts and specifically the statute with the Unified Union District talks about this fund transfer occurring within 10 days, I believe it is, of your operation date. So your operation date is July 1, 2018. You won't be able to make that transfer. And I've already run this by, uh, we've gotten uh, work with the Agency of Education on this and in other instances, and they say, yeah, you can't do it. It's probably 90 to 120 days before you'll be able to transfer surpluses or deficits. And what they want to see to address that is that your new board will work with the business office and the various treasurers and say, okay, this is what we need to transfer. These are the audit reports we need. Here's the schedule under which we want to see these transfers occur, which as I say, will be more in line with something along the 90 to 120 days, but it would certainly accomplish all the transfers from your member districts by the December 31, 2018 date, and the transfer from your supervisory union by the uh, January 31, 2018 date. So that's all I added there. There was one other question that is not specifically addressed here, which is the impact of this new entity on 
what I'll call local school fundraising activities. Okay, the parents or whatever in particular communities have historically engaged in local fundraising. That all occurs under the supervision of the local school board. Okay, well there won't be that local school district board at this point. Uh, nonetheless, in uh, and the examples are voluminous around the state in larger districts that operate multiple schools. So you take the Burlington School District. I'm familiar with that. Uh, my daughter, you know, grew up in and graduated from the Burlington School District. Five elementary schools throughout the district, and each elementary school had its own. Uh, parent teachers organization and its own student or parent or faculty based fundraising activities and the Burlington School District has procedures in place so that all of the monies collected go into the, the, the school district business office to be tracked but they are earmarked for the fund for the school building for which they were raised. And so what I put in to address that, and if you go to Article 7, again, I really didn't change much in Article 7 at all, but at the bottom of subparagraph D in Article 7, I added in, additionally, the existing elementary schools have been supported by their respective communities by non-property tax fundraising activities. The new SD board will develop policies that will allow the continuation of school-based fundraising activities. So it, it does need to be a policy. The money needs to be tracked through your business office. And, and frankly, right now it is as well. It's just it's the supervisory union's business office that is tracking monies that are being collected. And okay. And so we, had, um, I'm sorry, we so we had heard specific concerns, and we've had a, numerous discussions in this group about ensuring that those groups within each community understands that those activities will continue to be permitted. So I think the intention of adding this into Article Seven was to make sure that everyone understood that there was no reason that that would be, you know, expected to be changing. Okay. So, now, Mayor Kate, I think... Well, just there's some private non-profits that um, money, and the month can be said it was a private non-profit. Okay. And the and, money doesn't and, go into the okay. district, so it's not an issue for those. And right. Lincoln has the grand Lincoln School, I think, right? Yeah, they do. So, yeah. those will continue to want right. to be tracked yeah. through this process. And, okay. correct. Okay. Allison? So um, your addition at the end of D, mm -hmm. 7D, um, it mentions the elementary schools. What about the high school? Because mm -hmm. the high school has its own things that it does as well. Okay. I can add that in. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't, if it needed to be there, it could. It was there. Activity account. Yep. Mm -hmm. The activity account. Right. Or other things too. Yep. Okay. Great. Can I just point out, and I don't know if you were going to go back to this, um, the sorry, um, in Article Seven you did, and you have it underlined here. I think in back and forth with Donna, it's been revised so that in Section B it mentions the elementary forming districts, and in Section C the high school forming district. And we had some discussion about the importance of those different sections and were they redundant and so by clarifying that one section deals with the elementary schools and one deals with the high school that's addressing that concern. And, and the reason for that is your high school is currently owned collectively. It's owned by a union district. It's not owned by the town of Bristol even though that's where it's located. And so setting up a provision that says if you if the board needs to decides to sell the high school and build a new high school somewhere, uh, it it's more appropriate to say it doesn't go to the town of Bristol. It's more appropriate that it is something that is 
potentially just sold and the new entity builds a new school somewhere. Your elementary schools are all different in that regard. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Hold on just a second. Herb, did you have a question? No? Okay. okay. The other thing I'll, I'll mention, I did put in in A, real estate and personal property, no later than the forming entities. Remember, the forming entities include your supervisory union. Well, your supervisory union doesn't own any real estate, but it leases this space, and your sur supervisory union does have a lot of personal property. You know, we're, we're sitting in, on some of it. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I wanted to make it clear here that it's not just the school districts that convey to this new organization but it's your supervisory union as well. One of the things that may or may not be a benefit, by the way, of getting rid of a supervisory union is that under Vermont law, supervisory unions are not allowed to own real estate. They can only lease it. When you form a supervisory district, if there's an expansion that can be put on an existing building somewhere that is owned by the district to provide permanent office space, you know, for a central office, you can do that. I think I've heard that idea somewhere before. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so we should talk about Article 8 briefly. Uh, this has been restructured so that you have 15 board members who are elected on a population proportional basis and I may tinker a little bit with how I've worded paragraphs uh, A and B uh, but uh, this proportional allocation that you have uh, results in you know what is reflected in subparagraph D and I believe that this fully satisfies requirements of you know one person one vote equal protection analysis the the thing that I, I was trying to tinker with mathematically is whether in subparagraph a uh, I have a two-step process that you know, a and B that get to the number I can possibly consolidate that so that you know the, the allocation is going to be <coughs> based on uh, initial population minimums and uh, a, a portion thereof that exceeds 50 percent. Mary Key? Well, I just read uh, paragraph A, the last sentence has one for Lincoln, and then on the other page it shows two. Yeah. B fixes that. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. It's and interesting as a math teacher to read how a lawyer writes <laughs> how you deal with rounding. Well, it is. <laughs> All right. Half you get the the, and, and, and as a math teacher, maybe I will ask you this because this is this is a concern that I have. Is it mathematically possible if you had two districts, two towns that had the same population, and that same population mm. was one increment? plus 50% of an increment. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to end up with 16 board members. That is. Yeah, sure. so that I don't want to have that result. Well, I also think that part of, you know, obviously wanting to maintain the proportional, but part of the discussion has been the desire to have more than one person from each town, and because our populations allow that, I would hate for if we just went to straight rounding and. And I'm not sure exactly how close Lincoln is, but if Lincoln was at 1.55 and happened to go to 1.49, get rounded down, you know that that yeah. would, would be perhaps yeah. difficult. But that it's just that rounding issue that yeah. I'm yeah, trying to. Somebody in the future is going to have to deal with it. Well, I look at the statistical probability of <coughs> you know that that exactness occurring. And that's what I want. to uh, yeah. yeah, in terms of having more than one board member, you guys probably talked about it. You can have two members, they could just vote, count as a one and a half vote or something. You guys probably have already talked about that. Yeah. So okay. we did and consider then, different weighted voting methods okay. and we thought that we didn't really want to go down that road. And then does there need to be anything in here about 
um, if population changes? You, when population changes each 10 years, right? And then so you have to go back and yeah. reallocate. And do you, you don't need anything in here, you just do it. No, because it says it's based on the most recent uh, 10 year uh, population census. Okay, thanks. Determined by the most recent U.S. Census will be divided by 15. So when we have another census, you'll get new population numbers. You'll divide by 15, calculate a new population minimum. So, Jen? Yes, sorry. I'm trying no, to manage our remote fine. participants. I'm not. I know, that's fine. <laughs> I, I apologize. Steve, go ahead. So I think. My understanding of where this committee wanted to get to was to set it up in such a manner that all the towns always had a minimum of two, um, two uh, representatives on that school board. Um, and, and just the way the math would work to do that would be that um, uh, your initial population minimum you would actually divide by seven and a half, so that so and give so that so that you automatically gave not one board member but two board members to the to the board, so that each town had two board members. Is that what we wanted? I thought that's what we wanted. For instance, I mean, we are really. I mean, uh, the math is right here. And Lincoln really is within four or five people. I mean, of 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 not of being knocked down to one vote on that board. And I'm not sure that that's what we wanted to do. Let the me, math is a little different. Yep. Um, but but I, I I mean that was my understanding of where we what we wanted when we. When we originally start talk about the board of directors comp composition, and I, I guess I just sort of would like to hear from the rest of the board if that's what we wanted to do. You can set it up that way. So, we, so I don't know. I, I don't remember. I think we when we changed our approach to the board, we did it fairly. Quickly compared yeah. to the amount of discussion we had in the initial go round, um, but I think the the balance is making sure that it still maintains a proportional representation. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, but maybe we could, if this, the committee members that are present are interested in having Steve explore if there's a different way to construct that language, to try to maintain a minimum of two board members. Is that something that's of interest? Or are we happy with the way it is now? Roughly approximating proportional representation? Mm -hmm. as, the, as the representative, <laughs> the non-voting representative from Lincoln, are you yeah. interested in having the committee look into that? I, I guess just one practical thing that I've raised. So, uh, I'm trying to think the next census is 2020. 2020. We won't know about it until 2021, though. No. I can look at the... Uh, I'm not sure that it works. I, 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 it's, I mean, it's interesting. When you do that, what you're saying is that for every 1,690 population or part thereof, you get two. You know, so now you're sort of allocating them two at a time, and it, it gets a little funky. Huh? I'll have to think as well. It, it's definitely very interesting trying to figure out how, you know, how shifts in the population could affect it, because if our total population goes up, then that's going to change those numbers, and, um, you know, even if the Lincoln population doesn't change, it still could change that whole math. So um, Herb is raising his hand. So Herb, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, reiterate a point that I made before uh, that uh, uh, I think it's important with a strong, very, very strong supervisory um, uh, district organization that there be a strong board. And I'd be concerned about, I'd, I'd be a little concerned about a 15-member board 
been raising it beyond that in order to maintain uh, two reps for each uh, town, I think will make it even larger. Um, and uh, I, I definitely caution against that. Great. Thanks, sir. I, I know it's got to be really difficult to hear all the discussion at the table. I think that the the request is not to change the total number of board members, but to perhaps change the math in how the proportionality is calculated to ensure that every town has at least two board members. Uh, Ellen? But, but mathematically. But if you have to recalculate so that people have to each can at least two board members, uh, even with, you know, declining population, would that mean, it seems to me that would mean a, a bigger, larger than 15 member board. So, right, I, I think it's a great question. So I guess at this point we do have a quorum, so what I would love for the committee to do is to determine if we as a committee would like to ask Steve to spend time on looking at a different way to calculate this, um, or whether we are okay with what we have. Herb is raising his hand again. Herb? Uh, no, I wasn't raising my hand again. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it must be your text just came through again. I got you so quickly. Okay. All right, Ed, go ahead. Is it legal for us to make the two stipulations, we shall have 15 and no less than two per town? That's when you start raising issues under one person, one vote. Yep. Because right now, with the population distribution that you have, you're within tolerable limits. Because you're, it's not equal here, but it, it's close to being equal. Um, if you, and, and this was the problem that was raised in a uh, for instance, uh, Southwest, or not Southwest Vermont, but, uh, well, actually in Southwest Vermont, uh, in a different context, but the having a minimum of one vote, and just one, ended up in a situation where a community with 400 people has one vote, and a community with 2,000 people has one vote. And the U.S. Supreme Court is willing to say that that's a pretty significant difference. And so that's where the court, not the U.S. Supreme Court, but the District Court in Vermont said, uh, the only way I see that you can do that is if they are all elected at large. And so that is what happened in Southwest Vermont, meaning that they're nominated from particular towns, but that everybody votes on that so that you know not just the people from Woodford voting on the candidates from Woodford but the people from Bennington voting on the candidates and similarly the people from Woodford voting on the Bennington candidates and uh, I, I raised and, and you did, I know I think you had some discussion about this concept of uh, at large voters of uh, election and didn't want to have that that's so, why Addison Central voted the way they did. Um. So I, I want to remind us as well that while it's not easy for a future board to change these, this could be changed by bringing this vote to the voters at a time if this math stops working for us or we feel that we would be more effectively represented by a different model of calculating the board representation. So I think it is very difficult for us to imagine all the different scenarios that could happen. Um, I'm going to go to Elon, but we really need to move on. We still have a lot to talk about, and we need to save an hour to talk about the report. So, <laughs> I just yeah. want to point out yeah. that this math could easily end up with 14, a board of 14. Okay? Because you could easily have, like, if you're rounding up or doing the half, more than half, you could have seven, and then you're essentially doing something close to what she said on page two, and if Lincoln had six less people but nobody else had more, then nobody has that 15th board member. Yeah. So, right. just pointing that out math-wise. So then perhaps we don't need a motion. Perhaps we need to ask Steve to just to look at this one more time. I think mm -hmm. the language that our consultant had initially pulled, I think it might have even been from Rutland Northeast. There was like an initial population that 
determined the first set of board members and then those number of board members were subtracted and there was like a new, it was really, it sounded like really complicated, but it ended up that you were always only allocating the number of board members that were left and there was a different number that was used for the second pool. Mm -hmm. So that's when we had two things going on. Yep. Yeah, and we also had the proportional and at large, but yep. it would perhaps be a way that you at least ensure that you always end up with the right total it's, number. It sounds of like a members. great project for the math teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, homework. Thank you. I will. I'll run some calculations but, yeah. because the, the goal is that you're always going to have at least you, that you're going to have 15 right. members. Okay. Great. So maybe we can move through the next few a little bit um, quickly. I think the only thing that got changed in Article 9 was just um, clarifying, I think in one of the drafts, the language that the board terms would be three years had gotten yes. dropped and someone had asked about that. So that's been added back in. Nope. The, the whatever, the series of expiring for the first terms are still in there. That's just so that we get all those terms staggered. I think we better come back to Article 10. Okay. <laughs> because that one we might need to talk about. I'm mm -hmm. hoping we can cover a few here quickly. Um, did you make any changes in Article well, 11? The only thing in 11 is uh, I, you did not have when your first annual meeting date was going to be, and you don't have to here. Uh, but I didn't know whether that was, you know, intentionally. I mean, there's a reference in another article to it being in the spring of uh, 2017. Um, but uh, I don't know if you want to specify that that's going to be the first Tuesday of March or... Uh, and you don't have to. What will happen if you don't specify it here, which is not a problem, is if this passes and your, you'll, your new board is elected and it'll have an organizational meeting, uh, and that would occur, if all of this, this goes according to schedule, that would occur sometime uh, probably in maybe January of uh, 2017. Uh, that board would announce at the organizational meeting when it will hold the first annual meeting. And then that will get publicized and it will be warned like any meeting. So uh, if you don't need that, um, we don't need to put it in here. I just, okay? I, I don't see that there's any reason at this point to define it because I, I would imagine it would be a whole year later when there would be a budget to present. So. Mm -hmm. No, I think it should right be away. right away, but it would have to not clash with any of the other mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. meetings. There are two boards in existence. Like April 1st or something. Okay. Okay, great. So we talked about Article 12. Um, we, I just made clear in Article 13 that where you have Australian ballot voting uh, for the budget or for public questions, uh, the ballots will be commingled before they are counted. And instead of being counted at each clerk's office, they'll be delivered to the clerk of the new district and they'll be counted by officials in the new district. Now, they, the way that they get counted, they still come up with separate tallies for each community, but it's all done in that one central counting as opposed to each clerk's office counting its ballots and simply reporting a total. I think the need is like that now. Excuse me? I think the high school, middle school budgets are like that now. They get sent. I know that at the end it's just a total. The important thing is that it's not each town has to pass something. It's that the total electorate has to pass mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then 14 on school closure, um, you've got in here that in the first four years of operation there cannot be closure of a school, that after four years a decision to close the school will require two affirmative votes, one by the, uh, the district board 
and one by the voters of the town in which the school is located. Okay. Uh, community engagement and input. Uh, and I've made a revision here and I wanted to be clear. Structures to support and encourage uh, uh, public participation within the new SD will be established by the new SD Board of School Directors on or before, it says June 30 of the first full year of operation. Now that would be at the end of the year. Yeah. And I was wondering whether what you really meant was that they need to be in place before they start operating the schools on July 1, 2018. So it's a question of, and since this organization will have come into existence quite some time before, they would certainly have time to have those policies in place as of the date they began operation on July 1, 2018. In which case, what this would say would be on or before June 30th of or honored before June thirtieth of the it'd be uh, honored before June thirtieth preceding the first full year of opera. Yeah, why don't we just say June 30, 2018. I think Allison, I think you had proposed this language. Does that work with is that what you had envisioned in, was that they would be before the new district started right. operating the schools? Yeah. Because okay. then they would be able to those advisory Yep. people would be able to offer their advice mm -hmm. before you start talking about stuff that yeah. I'm just thinking logistically, how does an organization that hasn't yet organized conduct that business? Well, it, it, once it's organized, in other words, if the vote passes in November of 2016, the organizational meeting would occur probably within three months. There are different certifications that have to occur, but that's why I'm saying probably by the end of January, early February of 2017, this board will be up and operational because you will have elected the board members mm -hmm. in November of 2016 as well. So it then, under this document, has full authority to take all the actions necessary to be ready to commence operating on July 1, 2018. So that board is actually going to start meeting and in accordance with the open meeting law and it can begin adopting, you know, preparing policies and, and doing all of that. And it will need to prepare a budget and hold a quote annual meeting on a proposed budget sometime, you know, uh, prior to, and it may not be until, you know, uh, you know, the spring of 2018 that it actually, you know, holds a vote on a budget, but it'll have full authority to prepare that budget and put everything together. Okay. Great. Uh, Herm? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, so, Steve, I, I understood from your earlier, uh, emailed the comment uh, that uh, under the statutes, unless an article, unless a, a, a two types of articles, uh, there are articles that this board uh, is, is putting together right now, and then the articles that will appear in the warning. And as I understood your comment uh, previously, uh, Steve, you said that unless the article Unless the study committee article uh, was included within the warning articles, uh, it was not binding on the uh, a new supervisory district board. And um, at least that's that's what I, I, I read your comments to me. So would that mean that Article 15 and I guess Article 16 that we're uh, under the next one would not be binding on the new supervisory union board? See, the supervisory district. Okay, 
Um, and this gets into the article that we defer discussion of, which is Article 10. Or, uh, but what you have you know, mentioned is uh, substantially correct. And I won't say that something in here is not binding on the board. It's just a question of whether the board can change it in the future by a vote of the board or whether the board needs to get the voters to approve the change. As things are currently drafted, and this is the discussion that I know Jen wants to have about Article 10, is what goes into Article 10. And I've included some things in there, but I currently do not have Articles 15 or 16 specifically included in Article 10. So. Okay, yeah, uh, understood. Thanks, Dave. Yep. So let's finish Article 16 and then go back to Article 10. We're really going to try to wrap this up by about 8 o'clock so that we have time to move on to the report. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I think we could talk to you all night if you would stay all night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Article 16, what I understood is that, uh, and, and this is consistent with what I've seen elsewhere, that uh, students are the, the intent is that students will continue to attend the school in the town in which they reside. Okay, And so that's what we uh, shall support and continue the elementary education of students at the school located where they reside unless such school is closed. So that's the general provision. But then, and this is true in say a, a school like, a school district like Burlington where the school board annually adopts, and I'll, I'll call them zones, and they just put it on a map. And they say, if you live in this zone, you go to this elementary school. If you live in this zone, you go to this elementary school. Okay? And they then have, and, and that's something that is done by the school board as a matter of policy. And sometimes those change based on where you know, enrollments are shifting. But then they also have policies that talk about, uh, and generally it would allow the administration under certain circumstances to have a student attend a different school within the Burlington School District than their school of residence. For instance, special ed is a big one because uh, in terms of accommodating all the different um, disabilities that are exhibited in the Burlington School District. They may have a program at this elementary school that better serves a particular type of student. And so there's the ability to say, okay, you go there. Another example is maybe there is a bullying situation that arises in a particular school with a particular student. And the decision is that the easiest way to resolve this situation is, and typically it's with parental consent, if the parents consent, we will allow your child to attend this other school to get out of that situation. But those are special exceptions, and the general rule is that you go to school in the district where you live, and that's what I've tried to provide here. Okay. Great, thank you, Steve. So looking back at Article 10, so, um, and this is something that I'm, I recommend to be included in this document. Uh, I will say that not all of the consultants or attorneys who are working on these merger documents do this. Okay? So, if you say, gee, we didn't see this in the Addison Central Agreement, that may be true. But what was being, the, the point that Herb was raising is that you have this, and we'll call it the Articles of Agreement. And let's, let's just say that's, that's what you have. Uh, the Articles of Agreement become the plan for operation of your new district. Okay. But anything in the Articles of Agreement can be changed by your new board, by the board itself, not going to the voters. 
then in the formation of this, there is a document that actually goes to the voters. Okay, now this gets mentioned in it, but there's a, it, it's an, a, a meeting warning. And the warning has, and this is where things really get confusing, specific articles. Okay, because that's the way you put together meeting warnings. And anything that is specifically identified as an article, quote, in that warning, which is not necessarily everything that's in this document, but anything that's specifically identified in the warrant and is approved by the voters can only be changed in the future if the voters agree. The board itself can't change it. So there's certain things that are required at a minimum to be in the warning. And if we go to Article 10, You'll see what I've done is begin drafting the warning. Shall the voters of, we'll say Bristol, vote to form the supervisory district on the following terms. Okay, first of all, we identify the entities that are necessary parties. Okay, so that, that's part of it. And that's, that's what part of what is required by law. Uh, the Agency of Education has also said that even though Mount Anthony, Mount Abraham is not authorized to vote, they like to have them identified as a necessary party, and so I've added that language because they like that. Okay? Uh, you're supposed to identify what grades are going to be operating, so that's in here. Now these are also separate articles, okay? For instance, Article 3 of this basic agreement says we'll operate grades uh, pre-kindergarten through K. All I'm doing is now I'm putting it in as a separate specific item so that it cannot be changed without voter approval in the future. The board is going to be composed of 15 directors. Again, we already went over that. That's Article 8. But I put Article 8 right in here so that that cannot be changed in the future without going back to the voters. Uh, on the issue of disposal of real estate, I put in the provisions that everybody's going to transfer everything. Okay, now that's gonna happen automatically. But then the important thing that is in here is Subparagraph B, disposal of real estate for the elementary districts. Okay? By putting it in here, that can't be changed in the future unless the voters agree. If, it, if that did not appear here, and it just appeared in, uh, what is it, Article 7, where it talks about disposal of real estate then a future board could say, okay, we're going to amend that and we're now going to dispose of real estate in the following way. But with it in here, it's got to go back to the voters. Okay? So that's why I put in here. But I didn't put in, and you can see, I don't have in here the provision dealing with transfer of the high school because I look at that, that'll be an asset of this new entity. We already talked about why the individual elementary districts don't per se have some special claim there. And the new board will, if it, if it decides to close the high school, that will be, as a matter of law, a separate vote. Okay? Um, but it won't be addressed under this. It won't require this. Okay? Transfer of funds. Again, I just copied what's in the basic agreement. School closure, I put those provisions in here so that the new board cannot change the, the procedures for school closure without going back to the voters. So that preserves your four-year protection and your double vote approval. And then under state law, you're required to have in here that this plan and report, you know, is set up to provide for the governance of the new entity, 
but as I just mentioned, anything that's not here specifically voted can be separately amended. And so it really raises the, the, the question, and I see we're beyond 8 o'clock, are there other provisions that you want to put into this warning to say uh, we don't want the future board to have independent discretion to make those changes? And here it's a balancing act because on the one hand, you don't want to completely hamstring this new board. That it is going to be, there, there are going to be differences that will evolve over time. And this new board will need to have the authority that school boards have to deal with those situations as they arise without necessarily taking everything back to the voters. On the other hand, if there are some things that are sort of bedrock to, to get this passed, those are the things you, you do want to have in here to make sure that, you know, two years from now, three years from now, the community isn't lynching you because, wait a minute, that's a bait and switch, okay? Uh, and I picked these things because it struck me, you know, several of these are required by state law to be here, but the sc <coughs> school closure one, I figured, that's probably a bedrock issue. And then on the transfer of elementary schools, I figured that's probably a bedrock issue. Uh, but I did not put in, for instance, the community engagement and input. Uh, and I'm, I'm certain that that's important. Uh, but exactly how all of that occurs and yeah, that that's really a lot of politics. You're going to be electing these people, and uh, you need to work with them. Uh, school attendance, you know, which school building are people attending? Again, maybe four years down the road, five years down the road, there's a sense of, you know, there's no real reason to say that we'll just let the kids go to any elementary school they want here. Maybe that'll be the overwhelming community sentiment. Who knows? But anyway, so those are my comments. Thank you so much, Steve. And, and I just want to say, as far as I can tell, only Articles 15 and 16 are really only substantive articles that aren't in that warning language. There's some at the beginning that just say obvious things. So, Ed? Just a quick one. Number two says the new UUSD. Oh, I didn't catch that. There's a couple more in that. Okay. Beyond that, too. Okay. So I would be happy to entertain a motion um, about this new language in Article 10 if the board, if the committee feels ready to take action on that. We do, I believe, have a quorum, so we can take action. Uh, Steve, you had your hand up? Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, 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 move uh, uh, Article 10. As written with with uh, the uh, edits to remove, uh, 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 you know, there's there's ongoing <coughs> edits that are going to be required uh, for the for the composition of the board and to get rid of UUSD. But yeah. but as a general sense, I think that the uh, the language looks great, and I think that Steve has correctly uh, pulled out the bedrock issues. Great, okay, thank you. Seconded by Ed. Okay, and I know Herb has his hand up, so Herb, and then we'll come around the table. Uh, yeah, Jennifer, uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a little hard to hear folks that are a little uh, further from the microphone, so if you could, it would be helpful if you could repeat the motion uh -huh. uh, so that I can understand what I'm going to be voting on. Absolutely. Shauna, do you have the exact motion? Yep. Yeah. It's... Steve Pilcher moved to accept Article 10 as written, seconded by Ed McGuire. Uh, so I, I, I think I, the, the actual motion is as, as, as written, uh, uh, but the, yeah, sure, we'll just leave it as, as written. Right, I think the intention was to <coughs> acknowledge that there would be some editing that would not change the key items that were included within that article. I can put that in parentheses if you can. No, that's fine. Is that okay? We will still, I think as we've discussed before, we will still go back to and approve everything in its entirety when it's all done. Um, so, Elin, you had your hand up? 
So I'm still of two minds about this, whether less is better, like whether I'm thinking about the new board or I'm thinking about the public reading this. And if I'm thinking about the public reading this, it less is better. But on the other hand, is something like being able to continue to use school buildings so important to people that if they don't see it, they're going to be upset. I'm not worried about it going away. I'm not worried about the new board doing anything. Like, I don't feel it has to be there for the new board, but I'm curious, does it need to be there so that the public sees it there? Can't you, didn't we put that into one of the articles? It's in an article, but it's not oh, in it's not what's going to be warned and voted on. Right. And I have a feeling that more people are going to read what's going to be warned and voted on than the whole, than and all the articles. That was what has been my observation is that, you know, some people will read this entire agreement. Some people will read the entire report and agreement. But I believe from comments that I've received that a lot of people don't really read much until they actually see the warning. And they look at that warning and that's where they then you know, formulate their questions and decide, you know, what happens about this and that. To, uh, on the issue, and let's just talk about the real estate specifically. Uh, to satisfy the minimum state requirements, okay, uh, you would need to have uh, Basically, what go what is Article Seven, Subparagraph A, in the warning that is uh, for the <coughs> is that Paragraph Four, Paragraph Four A. Okay, that's all you would need to satisfy the state minimum. But then you might get questions, and people might say, well, wow, I don't like that. You know, what happens if they decide to close the school, or they don't need it anymore? What happens to it then? Shouldn't it come back to the town? And that's where I look at, okay, we answer that question right in the warning. And I will, I will also say, and I am aware of communities that have gone down this road so far, uh, and it's already beginning to raise some issues. The uh, some people have read, we'll say the whole thing, and it says in here, okay, if you're getting rid of the property, it comes back to the town. But the warning was prepared with only item A, and after approving item A. Some people have come back to this new board and said, now I understand though that if you decide to sell that building, it comes back to us. And they've requested a legal opinion, and the legal opinion is if we decide to sell it, maybe it'll come back to you, or maybe not. Because that's not in this warning. And they're already talking about well, we've got to go back and revote this because there's no way we would have agreed to, you know, this. We understood that whatever was in here, you were going to have to live by. And that's not the way the law is written. Great. Herb, you had your hand up? Um, yeah, uh, just uh, I think a general comment. I don't think Mike Fisher. I think I think he was going to try to participate, but I don't think he is. Uh, and and I know Nancy is, is not uh, uh, on participating either. And there were a few provisions that I think were uh, very important to them. Um, and so I'm I'm going to offer that. Um, <laughs> and there's a motion on the table, I guess, huh? Um, I would move to, I guess, amend the, the pending motion to also include uh, in the in article, or what is it, 10, uh, the warning article, um, the provisions of 
second the amendment so the amendment the amendment I think everyone heard was to amend the original motion so that it would include the paragraph 7d which we talked about tonight around the fundraising as well as articles 15 and 16 in the morning so making a more complete version of our articles on the morning is there any discussion Steve so I uh, find rather compelling, actually, and Herb, I'll try and speak up so you can hear, but I find very compelling and have thought um, all along that um, leaving some flexibility into what was originally, we originally talked about, uh, it was under the heading of school choice, but my feeling is that, that this school district, um, supervisory district, um, will uh, evolve over time and that thinking of just having students go to the building that's closest to where they reside may not always be what we want and so I would prefer to leave article 16 off of, of, of uh, uh, article 10 if you will. Great, thank you Steve. Any further discussion before we vote on the motion? Okay, so the motion, the motion is to amend the original motion to include paragraph 7D, article 15, and article 16 within the warning text. All those in favor, please, in the room, please raise your hand. We'll do the phones in a minute. All those in favor of amending the motion, please raise your hands. Okay, I have no hands up in the room. <coughs> Are you voting for or against the motion, the amendment? Again. So, and Herb, you're voting for the motion? You betcha. Okay, so we're going to let the record show that that's 1, 4, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, against, and, and 1 abstaining. And Michaela, did I count Michaela? No, 6. 6 against, 1, one abstaining. So yep. the amendment does not pass. So I'd like to move to a vote on the original motion, which was to approve Article 10 as presented with the warning text. So all those in favor of approving Article 10, approving the motion, uh, please go ahead and raise your hands in the room. So we have one, two, three, four, five voting in favor in the room. Michaela, how are you voting on the motion? In favor. In favor, six, four, Herb? I'm voting against the. Uh, okay, so that will be six to one to one, and because we have eight members tonight, we need to have um, at least six for two thirds. Right, and technically, we have seven vote members voting, which is actually not on my chart, which would be less than six for two thirds. There's probably five, um, because eight is technically <coughs> point three, but since we can't get a point three, we round that to six. So. <coughs> Okay, so then that motion passes, so we will um, incorporate Article 10 as written with a, the um, other edits as we have discussed or as come out. Um, so I think that is basically what we needed to cover on the articles tonight. Um, we, Steve has suggested that we should make an attempt, not tonight, maybe, maybe we can do this next week. We should attempt to call ourselves something, at least in the meantime. I know the last time we did that we had several motions and nothing passed. Um, so maybe you all could just reflect on that. You know, we have agreed that we think it's beneficial for the new board and this new entity to be able to do some community engagement around what do we really want to be going forward. Um, but for the sake of this report, it would be nice to call ourselves other than new um, and for the warning. So there's really kind of, it strikes me that we really have two options. So we either should go with Addison Northeast or we should go with Mount Aim <laughs> or maybe you guys have some radical different idea. But really, I think that probably 
at our next meeting, we should just pick something for the sake of getting it drafted. Steve? Jen, I just, I just want to understand from, from Steve, I mean, are, is formulation such as Addison Northeast School District, is that, a, is that a legally, I mean, is that a name we could adopt? I believe so. I don't know of any reason why you couldn't. All right. Or Mount Abe School District, if we yeah. so chose. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Ellen? I want to say I actually think it's easier if it's not one of those two things because of confusion between things that are all going to be existing at the same time. So if it's the five town district or, you know, if, it's, if we know that it's temporary, we don't need to go with the obvious choice, which is, I think, Addison Northeast. And that already exists and it's going to be existing at the same time. Okay, so it's something to look forward to for our next meeting. Although, although I do want to say, you know, we had to have dedicated some time to that discussion in the past, and since we have decided as a committee that we really want the new board to do the work of this, I would like us to not do a lot of work in figuring out what we want to just put into the report to call it. So I'll encourage you to come with your ideas and your and ready to make a decision about it to the next <laughs> meeting. Not bad. I will say the precedent in the state at this point for districts to be named for geographic features like Twin Rivers or Mountain Town and stuff like that. So you're going for Mount Eight. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> also a lot of precedent to and just go with what exists. Excellent. Steve, thank you so much for being here tonight and for okay. all of your help with this. I will get uh, I'm not in the office tomorrow, but I will have revisions. I will, uh, I'll see if uh, I've got a math whiz in the office. We will run through the, we can probably do like a 2,000 permutations of population distributions to see how, how many problems arise in terms of maintaining 15 board members with two for each town. Well, you know, I, the two for each town, I don't, it wasn't clear that that was a requirement. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. As thank a closing you. comment, I'll say you guys have done some really good work. Um, I, you know, I think you've made uh, some uh, tough decisions, I'm sure, getting to where you are, and it shows up in the document that you have drafted because I really have not done substantive stuff as much as just some technical editing and then trying to refine it to reflect some of the specific uh, goals that you want to accomplish. So <coughs> you should congratulate yourselves on some hard work and I will be back in touch. Excellent. Thank you so much. Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So, oh. <coughs> so we're going to move on to the net to item number five on the agenda, which is reviewing the report. I am going to turn it over to Katrina momentarily for that. I am struggling a little bit logistically. So right now we have a quorum meet with our two members that are on the phone. I don't know if it's going to be feasible. They are on two separate phones, so I guess their phones could be brought to two separate small groups or whether we would like to basically I guess we would have to officially adjourn if we were not going to keep the members on the phone and we could have discussion about the report um, so I don't know Katrina if you had had an opportunity to think about whether it's going to be feasible for people to participate by phone I think so I think could. right Michaela do you want to be on FaceTime so we can see your face yeah I think that would be helpful for me okay we can do that for her at least Okay, Herb, are you um, willing to continue participating by phone in the small group? Um, I, I don't want to see it now, it could happen. Um, and, and uh, it, 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 you know, it's a discussion. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't have any burning desire to try to listen to people uh, that I think, you know, it's very hard to hear anyone that. Uh, uh, far away from, you know, any sort of distance away from the microphone, Jen. So, uh, personally, I don't think it's going to be feasible. Okay. 
Well, I, I appreciate your patience with it. Um, I keep hoping we're going to figure out the technology that can make this work. Um, you know, the one thing with a small group is I think you're, that Katrina's envisioning groups of three or four people. So, you know, it would be maybe people who are sitting closer to the phone in a quieter space, which might be helpful. Um, but I also, if I understand that, you know, if, if that's not something you're up for, that's okay too. Um, we just would need to adjourn the official part of the meeting. Yeah, and, and I'd like to turn back in uh, when you uh, close the small group uh, uh, discussions. Um, I mean, I'm assuming there's going to be some sharing of what the small group discuss. And I know that uh, Nancy uh, sent in some comments. I sent in some comments. Um, and and uh, I don't know, Jen, when you think it's appropriate to take those matters up. So, so the way that we're intending to discuss the report is going to be through the small groups. Um, and I think that the more detailed comments were there, the request was to send them to Allison and Katrina and that they will be reviewing those is my understanding is that just collect all of the feedback that we get tonight and then right, but we'll, we'll, I mean will the small, have the small groups for example uh, received uh, Nancy's comments for example and and, and I guess uh, my comments so, so Herb, that's not really the structure of the small group discussion. Um, the, those detailed comments were going through Allison and Katrina at this point, um, and I believe they have received those comments. So, so if you would like to be part of the discussion of the, that's fine. If they're not going to be considered by the small group, so you know, spread up however you want, uh, Jen. Uh, but I would like at some point. I have to be able to address the issues that Nancy and I raised with the committee as a whole as opposed to just two individual people. Okay, thank you for that, that comment. I will um, talk with Katrina and see how we might be able to accomplish that. So would you like me to text you then when we're getting ready to come back from the small groups and see if you're yeah, available to join back in? Are you, uh, Jennifer, are you saying that um, Katrina will decide what whether when whether and how Nancy's comments and my comments will be considered. I mean, I'd like to be able to present them to the committee as a whole. So, Herb, I think what I'm saying is that I don't know how that's going to happen at this moment, but I'm hearing your request and that I will get back to you. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. So, I'll let you know when we come back from the small group discussion. Okay. Okay, thanks. Bye. Okay. So, Thank you for your patience. Okay. So we have to... Uh, oh, so yeah. we no longer have a quorum. So we... I should have done that before he left. We no longer have a quorum. So now we're just having an unofficial discussion <laughs> as an effective 825. Well, then we're in our small groups. We're not in a quorum anyway. So I don't... Okay. I don't think we have to... Action on that, I, we're not going to take action on anything, and we're going to come back together after. Okay, and when we come back together, if Herb rejoins the meeting, we will have a quorum. If Herb does not rejoin the meeting, we will not have a quorum, and then we just will not take any more action at that point. It's so much easier when we have a quorum. <laughs> Can I ask a general question? As we are talking about the report, I, I need to think of the audience. <laughs> So is the audience equally the public and Department of Ed, or is it more towards one or the other? Would anyone else like have? I, I don't have an answer to that. It's a great question. Um. I, I, I would hear it towards the, the general public myself. Okay. That's my feeling too. Okay. Because then, all right. Good. The Department of Ed would be interested in more because of the Right. Though they require this, and this is where we do all of our justification. So interestingly, I've had some emails, a few emails with Donna, and we can talk about that after we discuss the report, but she did specifically ask when we were going to be sending the report in, as well as those cover pages, if you remember those tables on those cover pages, I think they call them worksheets, um, because they are very clear that their review of our proposal is not just the articles, that they need to basically 
we need to demonstrate that this unification will be beneficial and will meet the requirements of Act 46. And so the way that we are doing that is through our report. So while I agree, like to me, I think we're writing it to the public, it also has to meet the needs of the Department of Ed, or the Agency of Ed. It is written in a way that convinces the voters of the five towns <coughs> that it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that will satisfy the state board. I think, I think I'm thinking of like asterisks mm -hmm. and explanations and things like that, mm -hmm. which the Board of Ed will already know. But. Great. Right. All right, Katrina, do you want to thank you for letting us run so much into the time we were going to spend on the report. I imagine that we may need to take uh, to end our meeting a bit later than our normal stated end time. Um, because we had expected to have an hour to discuss the report, but I will turn it over to you. I will stop talking now. You can tell us what you want us to do. Okay, so the idea is that you're in a small group of three or four people, and we're just going to move around. We've got three different spaces that you can be in. And in my email, um, we gave you three questions to be thinking about. Thinking about notable strengths that you're overall gleaning from the report. Um, in different areas or as a whole or both. The second one was where do you feel some information may be confusing and now you've identified the public as your audience, your general public, so what might be confusing to the general public. And then what critical information do you feel is missing from the report? Those are your three guiding questions. Um, hopefully when you read through it, you were thinking about that as you were. What I'm going to do is just kind of keep you moving in terms of timing through those three questions. The idea of breaking up into small groups is really so everybody gets a voice. So really making sure that all of you get to hear one another's thoughts um, so that it's not just listening to one person's comments, that everybody gets a chance to talk about it. So my job will really be to keep you moving and through those questions. The best way I think really to do it is when you get with your small group, I'll just say, okay, go ahead and go around your circle and talk about notable strengths. We will need somebody to take notes for Shauna, because <laughs> this could be a nightmare for you. So we'll make sure we have a note uh, taker nice in each group <laughs> who's actually jotting these things down, and that way they can just go to Shauna so that she can type it all up for our minutes or our discussion notes. points or whatever you want to call them if it's not a form. Um, so that's how that will work. And then I'll say, okay, two minutes, and then we gotta move on to question number two, which will be your confusions and then your what's missing. I was hoping 10 minutes per question. Mm -hmm. So really that's 30 minutes and I, I imagined it might go over a little bit. And then when we come back together, depending on the will of the group, we can talk about, you know, you can have a spokesperson kind of just give us some general trends from what you read. Um, but we don't have to belabor that too, too much because as Herb noted, there's some written feedback that we also were given. So between feedback that we've been given outside of this meeting and feedback that will get typed up, everybody will get to see the trends in the, in the data is what I was imagining. Great. And Katrina, can I clarify? I think that the intention is that folks who are visitors at this meeting would also be able to participate in this volunteer. Gotcha on my list. list. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sean and Shauna too if you want. <laughs> You've got a lot of hours invested into this place. <laughs> you know as much as we do at this point. So that's right. And you live in the fine town. Okay, questions about how it'll work? All right, so I was thinking in this room could be Patrick, Sarah, Stephen, Andy, and Michaela. And Michaela, I'll take care of you on FaceTime in a second, okay? Are you there now? Yeah, got it. I had to unmute, sorry. Okay, <laughs> Thank, yeah, I'm sure you do that a lot. <laughs> um, and in the kitchen, Allison, Ed, Mary Kate, Sean, and that's it. The kitchen is right on that side of the wall. And then in Susan's office, because it's the cleanest, um, Jen, Elin, Ari, Shauna, and Susan. Does, did I get everybody? Cool. All right. And one person from each group, take a notepad. That doesn't necessarily mean you're the note taker. You can work that out yourself. <laughs> Identify some of the highlights from your conversation, knowing that, and I think John will speak to this too, that more detailed opportunities of information is, is coming your way. And then Sean is going to type all this great stuff up for you. So as soon as everybody's back in the room, we'll do that. And, the way, and that's, she's getting him back. Oh, that what she's trying oh to do? Goodness. I don't think so. No, oh, no, she might have been here. But do you think I was trying to run away? <laughs> no, trying to get her. Oh, yeah. Red Rover, Red Rover, Red Rover. We can just call him and see if he answers. <laughs> it would probably be as good as that speaker somewhere. would do for you. Okay. I have a good speaker oh, that I'll uh, bring some. That's a nice image. Disconnected. <laughs> Be smart. 
<laughs> She's putting you in the bookcase. <laughs> That's a good place for me. There, there you are. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. I think we did say where a lot of people participate that way. Um, well, she's trying to call my a question about the Australian ballot and the um, so the commingle thing. So right now, this first time when they vote on it, they're going to vote. Everybody's going to vote by town. You bet. Yes. But if we change something, we're voting as an entire district. That's true. So, if somebody decided to change any of the, these things that we vote on, like, for example, the school, closing of schools, that would be voted on by the entire district. They could vote to change the fact that we would vote by town. Okay. That which you say is correct. Okay, thank you. We just spent a lot of time. Are we good to do so our highlights? I or? think we're good. Herb is going to be with us just momentarily. He's on the phone. He was just kind of joining the meeting. So we can go ahead. Thank okay. you. And we do now have a quorum again. Okay, so um, Patrick, how about your group? Talk about notable strengths, your highlights. Okay, strengths. Um, thought it was readable, uh, over perhaps too much implied knowledge. Um, for example, using terms like ends policy, does every, does every community member understand that term? And, and there are other examples like that. Um, like the uh, reasons why governance consolidation is a good idea were, um, were present and addressed in the document. There were some good examples cited in the document. There was a focus on the future and possibilities and what could be. The text was succinct. There was enough text, but not too much. Um, and the data regarding the different funds in Appendix B was a great, uh, was a great strength. Thank you. Just strength. Strengths. Yes, just strength. Allison, your group. Um, so again, not too much jargon. Good at keeping in mind audience we're talking to. Um, just one mention of on page six turning turning the language around to make it a positive. There's a positive feel to the narrative. Um, the charts help to understand what the overall picture looks like. And the focus at the beginning is about kids, which was um, greatly appreciated. Right. And Sean, are you reporting out for your group? Yep. Um, so the strengths of the report was that it was detailed and thorough. It didn't overstate. It highlighted many important points had a hopeful visionary tone, exciting. The data tables, or at least their, where they were, helped to balance out the narrative, and it was a good length. Great, thank you. I'm gonna pick on you, Sean, and go back around the other way. How about some confusions, and again, hi highlights? Hmm. Okay, one of them was if pre-K students were included in the charts. That's been changed. Okay. Um, less is more. Some sections were too wordy in regards to the narrative. It seemed um, like perhaps maybe paragraphs could have been more like one or two sentences. Um, there was some mention around language in regards to superintendent's time. Maybe not. I think we've talked, you guys have talked about that before, but sort of like not having it be all around the super, like, the superintendent's time and how they're spending time because you don't want people to just be like, well, we don't really care about the superintendent, this is about the students. So somehow, I think there was some careful wording, but maybe something more. Um, some of the charts were confusing. Uh, that's really general, confusing. That's what it's, some of the charts, some of the charts were confusing. Confusion around tax rates. Um, and then I think it was Jen said that sometimes we was, we weren't sure what we meant. Was it the NESU or was it Vermont? Or who is we? Um, adding narrative charts to clarify what they actually are. Um, actually, Ari said it in a really good way. So we need to provide bigger captions and table captions yes. so that each chart and table 
dem you know, it's clear in what uh, point it is uh, yes. functioning or supporting. Uh -huh. And right. so we need to be very careful that the that we only provide enough information to support the argument and not to uh, distract the readers. And perhaps <laughs> even supporting that further is to have like footnotes or technical notes so that the, the charts are easier to dissect. So that was that. Great. Mm -hmm. Allison, your group? Um, <clears throat> so confusing. The narrative assumes how it will be in terms of policy governance. Who knows if we'll be using policy governance, so maybe say good governance instead of policy governance. <laughs> um, there was a lot of info about state data, um, but not specific to our district. So if using state data make it applicable to our district, um, the information is in the charts in the back, um, specific to our district, but not specifically in the narrative. So bring that in. Um, equity and quality are bedrock to a lot of people, and we should make it clear that if folks feel that their school is a great school, that their great school will not lose control of that greatness and be brought to the middle, down to the middle of the entire district, but rather it's to have the entire district look at everybody's um, best practices and bring everybody's performance up, above the middle. Um, we do lose the focus after the beginning from being about kids to saving money, so keep the focus on the kids throughout. Um, again, the superintendent and impact um, include impact uh, um, of unification on the administrative staff and as well as the leadership teams who are our chief educators. Um, it's vital to make sure that people understand where cost savings may come from, but it's where the opportunities, increased opportunities for the students are. That's the important part. Um, the chart about board members um, pay, it was mentioned that Moncton gets paid based on number of meetings attended. So they've been to, they've had a lot of meetings in the past year, so their um, pay is skewed. Some of the charts are confusing. Charts need to note pre-K through 12, and then the census graph, um, do the percents match the articles of agreement board representation. Great, thank you very much. Patrick, your group. Um, so the, on page 20, the graphs, there's a question about whether or not there were fair comparisons um, on that page. Page 18, um, it was talking about some of the, the property tax implications and, and there was the comparison of the $200,000 home and I think the $75,000 annual income and, and uh, a little confusion as to is it either one of those or is they, are they combined somehow? Right. Um, so just looking to, and I think maybe the caption could be a great way to, to help articulate that. Uh, is there information here that's not necessary and adds some confusion to an already complicated issue in terms of the, the number of charts and graphs? And um, uh, If the audience is a community, then perhaps there's too much information included in the graphs. And on page eight, uh, who counts as an adult? Who counts as teachers? And why are there some blank boxes there? That, that chart seems confusing. The red chart. Or the red chart, yeah. The red, red notes. Okay. okay. And then I'll uh, ping pong back to you again, Patrick, for some highlights on your um, missing information. Um, there's some question about if there might be information missing about some of the specifics about the property that would be conveyed to the new SD. Um, I think the document uses the term specific when it mentions um, properties being conveyed, but question around how specific really is specific. <laughs> um, a general comment that maybe strengthening the language of the document wherever possible would be a good idea. For example, are there some places where the word could is used that could be changed to will um, to make it less speculative and that might be more convincing to folks who are reading this as, as a, this being something that will result in changes for the good. Um, and a question around what are the results if we fail to act? Like what's the, we, we sort of know the carrot in terms of the incentive, but what about the stick? 
Great, thank you, Allison. Um, so we need to hit harder on what's best for kids. Um, maybe a graph about the current board versus the unified board, what the governance structure and the arrows look like. Um, Did you mean an org chart? Org chart, yeah, yeah right. essentially. Um, it might be worthwhile from a town perspective to state what won't change. Still use um, dugouts in the fields, the kids are still transported, they stay in their schools. Um, and then the PTO many, and so maybe have um, a table of a variable and what our current structure has and what a unified structure should have and what we would need to change in order to accomplish the unified structure. Um, in the homestead tax rates, put in the calculation example that was used from the Vermont State Department of Taxes so that everybody understands how that's calculated. Um, are the tax rates all the same? When do we get our unified tax rate? How does that get determined? Um, the homestead tax rate. <laughs> table. Slow down for Sean. Oh, that's okay. Uh, you're going to give me that afterwards. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm doing, doing the best I can. Um, I'm misspelling a lot. Of this. So okay. the homestead tax rate, does that include the savings mentioned in the narrative? Um, and then consistency across the narrative in terms of charts and numbers in the appendices. And fancy fingers over there. <laughs> um, so let's see. We didn't really have that much, but so on page 17, the first year interest payment wasn't included with the debt. Um, and Elon thought maybe that would be an important thing. If we're going to have that on there, we should include all the debt, not just the, the principal payment. Um, the other thing is the somehow in there it has we have to highlight in some way that the unifying will um, allow everyone to finally vote on the supervisory union budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a su it's going to be one supervisory union budget, but it will allow everyone to vote on the greater. On more. Yeah. Um, and with that, with that, yeah, go ahead. And, and well, you're probably about to say that. Yeah, you can have it. The, no, that's okay. Go ahead. And just that the board will have more flexibility in balancing all of the different priorities in that budget rather than having chunks by assessment that aren't able to be adjusted yeah. if needed. That's what I was going to say. You're good. Sorry. I no, you're, you're good. Going to the next one. No, you're good. Okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you all very much. It, what was great for me to be able to be a fly on all of your walls was that everybody talked, which was awesome. The couple of meetings I've been to, that's not always been the case. So I'm really glad that everybody shared and felt open. And um, we have lots to look at and to organize in terms of trend data. There you go. I'm sorry I'm standing. I tweaked my... Kayla would be signing in <laughs> Are you? <laughs> she can hear well, you. That's awesome. right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ed. Will an effort be made to try and explain what Steve told us about the disappearance of the supervisory union board? The question for you guys. I just ran your protocol. I mean, that it gets to. <laughs> we don't have to vote on their budget because they're not there. Well, I think that that should be, you know, well, let me just answer with my opinion. <laughs> I mean, I think that that is a critical, that's like foundational to the, in my opinion, I, I was really shocked the way Steve was saying it wasn't, but to me that's foundational in going to this new model. It's that instead of having all these boards, you have one board and you have one budget and that's, you know, fundamentally changes it. Maybe that chart, I think in your suggestions, that chart with all the, the organizational flow and all the lines and the arrows, you know, might help to introduce or to have a visual to go with that. It's a two-step process that we're going to take in one step. We hope the third and state will then definitely know what we mean. We want this one. Arrows. If this, this isn't one. what we're saying, then quickly fix it. <laughs> yeah. Great. 
Thank you, Katrina, for running that. I thought that was a really nice way to use small groups. This committee has used small groups in the ancient history of the committee. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done that in a while, but it is a really nice way to get everyone an opportunity to participate. And I love that it feels like we produce something that can be acted on out of that small group time. So it felt really productive to me. So for myself, anyhow, thank you for organizing that for us. And for all the work that went into oh creating this, gosh. it's just. I hope we sandwiched it well. You're supposed to start well with a lot of positive, add in your suggestions, and end with a very positive. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, Katrina and Allison, who've really been doing yeah. the legwork to get this all together. So it's great. Yeah. In, in ours, you said, so if we have little nitpicky things that we are to send them to both Allison and Katrina, or? That's fine. Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. okay. And I think yeah. that they should, in, I'm just saying for the fact, for the people that aren't here, if they had input, if you want to email that to me just so I can add it into the, I don't know if that's. Oh, I it's think five probably pages. we need to. Oh, it's five just, pages. Okay. I think that we need to capture the the minutes of the discussions that okay. we had tonight. Um, I think we will probably need to talk about in what way it might be relevant to share any okay. sort of the detailed feedback that comes in. Um, you know, we have in the past provided detailed feedback in the agenda packet. I find it tends to just make the agenda packet longer, mm -hmm. um, and we don't necessarily all go over that as a committee. So. Um, I would definitely be happy to think about that, but I, certainly okay. if you have specific, you know, that detailed kind of feedback, um, please do feel free to go ahead and provide that. So the next item on the agenda, we actually skipped over agenda item number three to approve the minutes. Um, I'd love to just get that taken Move care of. Ed I'll makes a motion to approve, seconded by Elon. Is there any discussion? Elon has discussion. A straw poll is P O L L. I can't remember what it was. Oh, it's not a straw poll. It's not straw poll. Oh, it's a poll. It's a poll. I thought it was like a poll. Like, you know. oh. <laughs> so, do you actually have a quorum right now? We do. Herb, we have Michaela and Herb. Herb. Herb is there? Okay. Herb, are you with us? Sorry, I didn't think he was with us. Uh, yes, I yeah. Always good to be certain. Okay, so then I guess we would need to amend the motion. <laughs> they make All a the motion that we try to, <laughs> try to do that? Well, we would have to approve the minutes with the corrections. Um, Mike actually forwarded me something about Robert's rules and amendments last time, and if there is an amendment that is seem to be generally accepted to the body that I can say something along the lines of hearing no objections, the motion will be amended. Typically our amendments are fairly substantive and I haven't felt that we would want to just assume that everyone's okay with those. I, I would imagine in the case of correcting that spelling in the minutes that... That's fine. That's so, so Elin has offered an amendment to um, the motion accept with to correction. accept with corrections and hearing no objections we will consider that motion amended. And so all those in favor of approving the minutes, please raise your hands. So we have one, two, three, four, five in favor in the room. Um, Herb, how are you voting? Yes. Yes, and Michaela? Yes. <laughs> Excellent, so that's a unanimous vote to approve the minutes with the corrections. Thank you. Well, it's good to take care of that so we don't have to do that again next week or at the next meeting. So, which brings me to the next thing we have to talk about, which is when we all want to see each other again. And um, I realize that most of you would probably like to not see me again until the end of the summer. But that not being an option, <laughs> um, we did, we did um, send out a doodle poll. And thank you to those of you who were able to participate. I know we're really struggling. You know, it's summer. People have plans. Some people are willing to participate in these meetings despite having vacation plans with their family, and they get a super amazing bonus award, you two, on the phone, um, <laughs> and anyone else who might try to do that. But I know several of our committee members are traveling and are generally not available in the next couple of weeks. Our timeline, which is in the packet, somewhere on page, like the, is it? Yes, on page five of the packet. Um, envisions that we would have a meeting next week where we would finalize the report. Um, 
and that we would basically it envisions that we have three meetings coming up soon or four meetings even um, we so we have provided a lot of input on the report what we're trying to get to is having a community forum and an opportunity for the boards to have a presentation about the report we did ask Karen to send out and try to poll board members on whether they were available I didn't get a chance to check with her on what that feedback looked like I do know for our committee that that week looks better than some of the other weeks that we've been looking at um, and we could go ahead and have a community forum even if we don't attain quorums for all of the local boards because there still would be an opportunity for the local boards to discuss the report in August um, so really what I think we need to determine is how many meetings do we need to have have between now and when we have a community forum is really kind of the driving factor here and then we will presumably need to meet after that community forum before we get to a reasonably final draft of the report there is one more important thing that I have learned just in the last 24 hours that I want to share with you guys don't like it's not like oh my gosh but the AOE is actually really interested in seeing our report before it's done which is kind of cool so they've been looking at our articles and giving us input and they are also very interested in seeing the report and reviewing it and giving us feedback before we get to being done you know I had kind of understood the process was we had to yeah, get done and then we had to give it to the lawyer and then we had to give it to the AOE and you know at any point that one of those people might go like ah you can, you know you did something really bad and we would have to you know deal with that so to me being able to have these things reviewed in process is a huge win I imagine that because we've had so much discussion on this report draft tonight that we wouldn't want to send the draft as it currently exists to AOE that there would need to be another revision to it does this committee feel like we want to look at it together again before that draft goes to AOE before it goes to the lawyer before it goes to the community forum I'm seeing no. no's on the, yes. the other Before reviewers. The community forum seems different than the others. Agreed. Okay, and Herb, you want to? You had a comment? Yeah, I, I, I was trying to catch what, what you were suggesting, uh, Jim, and uh, I think you were asking, you know, whether to send the report on to the AOE. Uh, before a next meeting or before a next draft, um, I would certainly, um, I, I'd certainly like to see uh, the, the comments of Nancy and myself taken into consideration before you send something to AOE. Okay, great. And I, I guess I would say, and not being the person who's going to be revising the report, um, but I would expect that any detailed comments that are provided would be considered in producing that next draft of the report is that is that a fair Katrina's nodding her head yes and Allison's nodding yes so I would I would see that those would be considered in that revision process um, the question is really you know whether we feel we need to have another discussion as a committee keep in mind that having either our lawyer or the AOE look at the draft in no way binds us to what's in there it just might help to raise you know AOE might have suggestions about you know some of the things that we raised you know do you really need this chart or you know I have no idea what kind of feedback they might have on the on the report um, okay so Jennifer let me be, be a little more clear I, I would like uh, to have another meeting uh, before we um, uh, actually I, I think we need to have another discussion of the report before uh, we go on Okay. I take it that you were saying that uh, the people who were drafting this, the, the report, will take Nancy and my comments into consideration. Uh, you know, I just want to see what sort of consideration is given to them, uh, and I'd like some uh, discussion of that. Are, are, is she raising her hand? Is that why? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Michaela. Hi. I was just thinking that um, knowing that the month of July is challenging to get committee members together, and we have this pretty incredible opportunity to get 
feedback from the agency of education, it would seem like it would be most useful for us to get that feedback from them as soon as possible so that we have the most amount of time to really think about the information that they give us and consider it as a committee. And if we hold off waiting on getting that feedback from them, um, you know, we're getting later and later into the summer and, and, um, and that makes me a little bit worried. It feels like this is an opportunity and the sooner we can, it's not binding us, it's, it's allowing us some, some information that could be really useful for us. Great, thank you. Any other discussion? So, so Sarah is, is inquiring very quietly whether we need to vote on it. I don't think we need to vote on it. Um, I think it was more that I was interested in, you know, if the committee really, the, the members of the committee who are in attendance tonight wanted to say, oh my gosh, don't send this out until we look at it again. You know, I, I think it would be useful to know that. And if that, that isn't what I'm hearing generally, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't want to construe that we have complete agreement, but I think that the in general, I'm hearing that it would be interesting to hear what the AOE says and that we don't need, that doesn't imply that we are accepting everything in the report as it's written just because we've sent it for a preliminary review. Was there a, I think Steve had your, you had Yeah, your so I, I am, um, I'm sort of, I, I would like, I, I guess, I'm not sure I want to send what we have tonight to no. the AOE, right? No, what they're saying. No. I want to have something that's been <laughs> updated based on at least um, both both uh, comments that were submitted as part of part of the work we did tonight plus plus um, uh, some of the other comments I have some comments I want to throw throw into the mix as well so an updated report I I don't have a problem with sending an updated report to the to the AOE um, because that's all I'm doing is asking for their opinion. I, um, you know, their opinion, that's great. And, and it'll, it's just one more data point. I don't know that they'll have a chance to give us an opinion by the time of our next meeting. I can't imagine that they would, but. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I would agree. That sounds like that would be highly unlikely. I, I can only imagine that the folks who will be updating the report might require <laughs> that much time to, <laughs> to digest all of the feedback. Um, so, you know, so one possibility would be we had put a tentative date on July 13th to review the report and to prepare for the forum, which we had tentatively scheduled for the 18th. So we could potentially not have a meeting next week. We could allow time to work on the report. We could have that draft shared with our lawyer and with AOE. I don't know, I don't want to commit that we would have any comments because I don't get to be in charge of that. Um, but then we would regroup. The only thing that we should note is that if we're looking at, you know, we had talked about 718, uh, which is a Monday, looking at our committee calendar, the 20th is like all green. So we could look at Wednesday the 20th possibly for that community forum if that seems better to people. But that's still only a week after the 13th. So do we feel that, you know, is that going to allow us enough time? The report would probably potentially require revisions after that meeting. I don't know. Before we're ready to send it to the community, we might want the community to at least have the option to look at the report before the forum. You know, that's really sort of, you know, I want to make sure that we have enough time for the things that, the time that it takes. And I want to be really confident that when we announce the date of that community forum, that it's a good, firm date. Yeah. So, Herb, you were raising your hand? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm dubious <laughs> the time between, uh, if, if she can, I think, uh, meeting on the 13th uh, to review a revised draft followed by a community forum. It, um, what it, uh, I, you know, I think I think you cut it short because uh, you know the, the meeting on the seven six or seven seven. I mean, I think what, what 
interview, get everything done that you need to get done on the 13th, and it will look like have a final report, uh, you know, nailed down and sent to the, you know, the community and the boards for the evening. So, Herb, I'm hearing your suggestion that we should have a meet, you know, a meeting next. That we should have three meetings then, rather than two. Is that sort of the bottom line of your comment? Uh, I don't. I, no, not necessarily. Uh, you know, seven, six, seven, seven aren't, aren't probably are not very convenient for a lot of people. But I'm just saying that if your next meeting is on the 13th. I think you're sweetening the jail in terms of getting that final report. You know, preparing the final report. I mean, you can present a draft on the 18th, on the 13th. Um, then you're going to have discussion and, we, you know, changes, maybe. Uh, and then you get that. And I just think, you know, the five days is kind of short. That's all I know. Katrina? I guess I just need clarification about what it is that the group wants to bring to the community forum? Is it an opportunity to get more feedback into the report to influence the final draft? Or now I'm confused that some may have the impression that we're bringing a final report to the community forum. So I can only respond that I don't know that we have clearly established exactly what the goals of that community forum are, although the communications working group will be meeting later this week to be talking about that. Um, my sense, we, we have had a lot of discussion in, within this committee about the importance of having community input before everything is final and done, and so I think our goal of having a community forum in the summer rather than in the fall once the Board of Ed has approved it is because it's not too late to incorporate some you know, those ideas at the same time, I think we want to know enough that we have, you know, we have a fairly complete draft, um, and we feel pretty good about the numbers that are in there. You know, I would, I would be nervous if we still had significant questions about the charts, for example, and what those numbers mean, um, that that might cause more harm than good to bring that out to the community. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. So it's. It's getting late. I'm not looking for you guys to make a motion on this. I'm just trying to get a sense. Um, based on what I can see in the doodle poll, it's, it's questionable whether we would have a forum if we scheduled a meeting for either the 6th or the 7th. Did I say forum? Yeah. Okay. Did you mean quorum? No, I don't know if we would have a quorum if we schedule a meeting for the 6th or the 7th. So next week does not look highly favorable for that. Um, if we feel strongly that we want to get together, we can get together and have discussion um, whether or not we get a quorum. Um, I also, I guess I should also ask, mm -hmm. I'm looking at Katrina, but Katrina and Allison, you know, if we have a meeting again in a week, you know, what's the likelihood that you would actually have, you know, with, in a week with a holiday weekend in the meantime, you know, will we have a new draft of the report to look at for next Wednesday? It would basically need to be done by this Friday to get it to folks. Uh, right. if, if we're not going to have a quorum and it's just a discussion, it could be later than that. Well, the agenda would need to be warned by this Friday. We, we have an unfortunate common practice in this committee of sending things when not in the agenda packet. Um, so I would imagine with the short time frame, we could perhaps accommodate like a draft that came out by the end of the day Tuesday if we met Wednesday, but I don't, you know, I'm asking what is reasonable and what's not reasonable, and I don't want either of you to feel like you can't, you know, take advantage of your holiday weekend plans with your family because you have to write the report all weekend. I mean, frankly, I'm, I'm taking a little time on Tuesday, so, and Monday, um, but my narrative section is a little less dense than the charts and graphs part, so I really need to defer to you, Al. Um, it wouldn't be ready to go in the agenda packet, but I think we could have something significantly revised based on the comments that we've gotten, um, incorporating some of the new information that we need to put in there. I think we can have a substantial revision available. Okay. 
I also wonder about the expectation of how to use the feedback. I, I think that there's some feedback that we received tonight and have received via email that have some pretty clear trends to them. And then there, are, there is some feedback that is kind of an outlier and it doesn't necessarily go along with feedback from others. So I'm wondering about the committee's expectation to respond to every single thing or would our job be really to try to incorporate as much as we can around the trend data? So my opinion would be that the, any work you can do to try to identify trends in the suggestions and to work with that would be most reflective of the feedback of the committee as a whole. Um, but I welcome any other opinions on that. Steve? Uh, so I'm just, I mean, we're, we're beginning, we're talking about it, uh, uh, the possibility of a meeting next week. Um, uh, at least part of it is to accommodate um, uh, either her or, or Nancy or Mike. Um, are, what's their availability next week? So, um, from what I can see in the doodle poll, I'm assuming Herb is still traveling and possibly willing to join us by phone next week. Herb, is that true? Great, and I see it looks like Nancy is tentatively available on Thursday, but not Wednesday. Um, we have other committee members who are available Wednesday, but not Thursday. It looks like we have Katrina Thursday, but not Wednesday, and it seems like since you're doing a lot of the work on this, that's probably kind of important to have you here. Um, Thursday. So it sounds like we're probably leaning towards a Thursday meeting next week. And then we will keep the meeting on the 13th and we will, the communications working group will go forward in making a plan for the community forum. We will determine in our meeting on Friday whether that would be on Monday the 18th or Wednesday the 20th. And we'll try to look at whatever feedback we got from Karen from the board members as well. Um, I think as far as there's no way to determine from the community what the best date is, but we just need to be sure to announce it with like we need to announce it imminently so that people have time to plan to be there. What Hopefully time? they'll plan to be there. What time next Thursday? Next Thursday. Um, I assume it will be 6.30 as usual. Same Since point. you guys want to start earlier. 6.30 next Thursday? Here. Okay. Awesome. Thank you guys. So with that, uh, we're going to table the other business section of the agenda. And we are going to, I would welcome a motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved. Great. <laughs> Seconded, Seconded by Elin. Um, all those in favor of adjourning, please raise your hands. I guess we usually just say aye for adjourning. Right? Aye. Is anyone aye. opposed to adjourning? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you guys so much. Sorry we ran so late this, this uh, evening, but I really appreciate everyone being here. <laughs> it's like, see you. <laughs> like, I'm out of here.